And this is where we are here talking about the functional approach. And one of the most important things that we do in functional and nutritional medicine is address the inflammation. Because while inflammation is beneficial for repairing the tissue and promoting survival, chronic inflammation can lead to progressive tissue injury and reduce survival. Clinical evidence demonstrate that chronic inflammation plays a significant role in a broad range of cardiovascular diseases. For example, every step of arthrogenesis from the development of the endothelial cell function to foam cell formation, plaque formation and progression, and ultimately plaque rupture stemming from architectural instability is driven by cytokines, interleukins and cellular constituents of inflammatory response. So in other words, we really have to address inflammation, not just put patients on statins. In this interesting diagram, I wanted to show you kind of like the mechanism of, of the arteriosclerosis as the underlying cause of heart attack and stroke. As I mentioned previously, it used to believe that cholesterol was a key component of the arterial plaque because elevated levels of LDL cholesterol and apolipoprotein B, or as it's shown in some labs as APOB, are the main structural protein of LDL and are directly associated with the risk for arteriosclerotic cardiovascular events. However, now we understand when you look at this graph, you can see the monocytes and macro macrophages involvement in this process, we understand that inflammation is a key player in this condition. So we're starting with retained lipoproteins are modified, those LDL particles oxidize, and then along with other arthrogenic factors, it promotes the activation of endothelial cells. And activated endothelial cells increase the expression of monocyte interaction or adhesion molecules and promote the recruitment of other immune cells, including dendritic cells, mast cells, regulatory T cells, and T helper cells. And then the monocytes differentiate into foam cells. So in the red circles on the right side, you can see that the macrophages express receptors that mediate the inter internalization of VLDL, APOE remnants, and modified LDL to become foam cells. And as the inflammatory signals pathways are activated in macrophages, in macrophage foam cells, more immune cells are recruited into that area and more LDL particles are modified. Now, this is a vicious cycle. And you can see on the right side, basically the accumulation of those macrophages, foam cells, immune cells together into a buildup that over time worsens the arteriosclerotic buildup. This is why it's so important to address not just the lipid profile, but most importantly, the inflammatory process. So let's dive into the causes of chronic inflammation, oxidative stress, and arteriosclerosis or vascular injury. So the intestinal microbiome plays an important role in controlling the whole body metabolic homeostasis and organ physiology. So we know in the functional medicine approach that the gut is not separate from the other parts of our body. And this is going to be very different, of course, from the mainstream approach in which you have a, you have a GI problem, you go to see a gastroenterologist, or you have, a, you have a problem with your cognitive function or brain function or logical, you go see a neurologist, right? Here we understand that it's all connected. Changes in one system can impact another system. And changes in the intestinal microbiota and impairment in intestinal barrier leads to immune response that initiate inflammation. And we'll talk more about those mechanisms. But remember, if you just remember two things, remember microbiome and the GI barrier. Those are the two things that are really important. The term metabolic endotoxemia describes the link between gut bacteria, endotoxins, and their circulating levels with inflammatory induced obesity and metabolic and cardiovascular diseases. The metabolism of choline phosphatidylcholine and L-carnitine by the gut microbiome lead to the formation of several meta metabolites such as trimethylamine. And we'll talk a little bit more about the process and how does that cause inflammation and injury to the vessels. Trimethylamine is converted in the liver to trimethylamine N oxide. And both hepatic and gut metabolites are re reported to be predictors of arteriosclerosis and cardiovascular diseases, further supporting a link between the gut microbiota and heart disease. Bacterial translocation, which means the passage of viable bacteria and their components from the intestinal tract into extra intestinal sites, such as the bloodstream, the internal organ, the lymph nodes, 
And the impairment of intestinal barrier function is reported to lead to the bacterial tr translocation and releases of bacterial products, which triggers an inflammatory reaction. So in other words, if our gut barrier is not functioning properly, for whatever reason, there's chronic inflammation, there's food sensitivity that causes an inflammatory reaction and opening of the tight junction. With some patients that could be gluten, for example. With other patients, it could be other foods that are have a, an immune reaction to it, to those foods. It could be also environmental chemicals, and it could be also a certain medication that causes an impairment to the gut barrier. The increase in permeability also leads to the passage of dietary metabolites by products such as short-chain fatty acids and lipopolysaccharides. So short-chain fatty acids, as I'm going to show you in, these, uh, in a few visual graphs, is really important for reducing inflammation. It's produced by the gut bacteria when you eat fiber. Lipopolysaccharides are found on certain bacteria, and our immune system sees that as a foreign compound or molecule, and it initiates this strong immune response, almost like an invader. Uh, an invader will trigger the military to go into battle. Short-chain fatty acids produces a byproduct of dietary fiber and have anti-inflammatory properties. And as we mentioned, lipopolysaccharides is a major component of gram-negative bacteria. The cell walls of those bacteria can promote an acute inflammatory response by triggering the release a vast number of inflammatory cytokines. What does that look like when we look at it visually? So in this picture, we can see how the gut microbiota and some relevant molecular pathways connecting gut dysbiosis, right, which is the, the overgrowth of certain bacteria that could be harmful. How is that linked to cardiovascular or cardiometabolic diseases? In the bottom, you can see the gut lumen, which is where food travels, and bacteria live. And on the top arrow, we can see the blood vessels. And in between, are, you can see the gut cells. You can see a few of the gates between the, those cells that keeps the bacteria and the food in the lumen. And in the middle, you can see a few of the immune cells and how they respond. So let's take a look at this particular response here marked in a red, red circle. On the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria, you can find the lipopolysaccharides. They're marked in the bottom as LPS. If the patient has an increased intestinal permeability, meaning that their gates between the intestinal cells open up, that could be caused by consumption of gluten, genetically modified foods, inflammatory reactions, that could be different foods for different people, and then all the secretion of xanolin. The cells basically open up, the gates open up, which leads to the increase of migration of the lipopolysaccharides, LPS, into the bloodstream. Now, small amounts of LPS is normally transmitted through between the cells into the bloodstream in, under healthy physiological conditions in all of us. But when you have a patient that have increased intestinal permeability, that means that much larger amounts of LPS is transitioning. And here you can see the transition in that red arrow into the bloodstream. And so as LPS moves into through slides or leaks through the cells into the bloodstream, it triggers an immune reaction and the expression of inflammatory cytokines. You can see them here as interleukin-6, IL-6, or interleukin-1. Those are secreted by a variety of, of cells, um, such as activated macrophages. And the mechanism is, of course, by stimulating the TLRs. And of course, activated dendritic cells can also secrete, and other inflammatory cells can also secrete those inflammatory cytokines. And that leads to an increase of those inflammatory cytokines in our bloodstream. And when we have more inflammation, we have more oxidative stress, which means that we have more reactive oxygen species, more free radicals that travels along the bloodstream into our heart, internal organs, and start to cause damage to the blood vessels. On the other hand, on the right side, we have a few mechanisms that our body in its wisdom is designed to prevent that from happening. So we mentioned the short chain fatty acids. You can see here the SCFA. Those are the fatty acids that are produced when our friendly gut bacteria ferments the fiber that we're eating from the fruits and vegetables or from the legumes uh, such as beans. And these are the main source of energy for our cell lining in the colon. And they also play a role in regulating the innate immune cells, including neutrophils, macrophages, natural killer cells, isonophils, basophils, 
and innate lymphocytes. The problem is starting where if we don't have enough short chain fatty acid, because for example, we don't consume enough fiber, we lose the diversity of the healthy gut bacteria and we don't produce enough short chain fatty acid. And that leads to dysregulation of the immune cells. And then together with a dysbiosis or a state of increased intestinal permeability, as we talked previously, that is just a recipe for more inflammatory cytokines in our, in our bloodstream and more reactive, reactive oxygen species that can cause damage to the blood vessels. So bacterial translocation, as we mentioned, is reported to contribute to congestive heart failure, leading to a vicious cycle where impaired cardiac function impacts intestinal microcirculation, leading to a barrier defect in the intestinal mucosa. There was a study that uh, reported that it compared the gut microbiota derived from fecal samples of three groups, patients with cardiovascular diseases, heart volunteers, and patients with coronary risk factors without cardiovascular diseases. And what they found is that there is a significant increase in lactobacillus in the group of patients with cardiovascular diseases. Animal study published by Kramer in 2017 reported that several species such as Porphyromonas gingivalis, Agrega tibacter, were associated with an increase in plaque size in animal models following by following an oral or intravenous infection. So some of these species live in our mouth as well and our gums. And so this is another way to show the connection between oral health and the bacteria that could impact also our cardiovascular health. So the take home point from these studies is that patients with cardiovascular conditions might have a different gut flora composition. They have different levels of different bacteria that increases their risk of developing those conditions in comparison to healthy individuals. For that reason, there are several newer lab testing that were developed to show us the diversity of the gut uh, bacteria. So you can see this is one of those labs. Uh, it's a comprehensive testing that includes diversity check of the microbiome. And this test is called GI360. You can find it by doctor's data. And the first graph summarized the abundance. So on the first upper side, you can see the, the abundance of those number of groups of bacteria. And then in the bottom, you see the diversity score that a patient can get for, for their diversity or their dysbiosis. And if you're interested in learning more about this particular test, uh, in the GI module of the functional medicine platform, uh, there is a specific class on interpreting this lab and treatment strategies.